verse 1 says that David was, the, was anointed by God to rule over Israel. Verse 2 says, the Spirit of the Lord spake by the lips of David. And verse 2 says, the words of God himself were in David's mouth. The Lord himself is the one who chose David to be king over Israel. He wasn't looking for it. He wasn't out angling for it or trying to vie for it and apply for the job. He was simply tending his father's sheep as he had been uh, instructed to do. It's been said the best preparation for tomorrow is to do what you ought to do today. And uh, David was caring for his father's flocks and herds as an obedient son. And when God was ready to elevate him, he sent the prophet uh, Samuel to the household of Jesse. And uh, David, the youngest of the seven boys, turned out to be the one God had in mind to rule over the nation. And the Lord told Samuel, arise, anoint him, for this is he, 1 Samuel 16, verse 12. God thought, he'll do just fine. David grew up in the small town of Bethlehem. Bethlehem means the house of bread. Bethlehem still survives to this day. He ruled as king over Israel from the city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem means the city of peace. And there is no lasting peace in Jerusalem right now. But there will be when the Prince of Peace sits down upon a throne and governs the world and the universe by extension, but not until that time. It's funny how God names the city, the city of peace, in anticipation of lasting peace only when the Lord Jesus Christ comes. There has never been any lasting, permanent, um, reliable peace in Jerusalem since the time it was incepted since it was begun, but, I, but the name was given to it in anticipation of the one who will come one day and bring lasting peace. One of the nicest hotels in Jerusalem is called the King David Hotel. That's where uh, politicians and dignitaries stay. Um, Jerusalem still survives to this day, and the world has never forgotten about David. The story of David and Goliath is still told all over the world. Advertisers use it to promote their products, or politicians use it to um, inspire their campaigns. You know, I'm the underdog taking on the entrenched politicians, or our product it may be small, but we're taking on the big corporations and so forth. Uh, God raised him up from being a small shepherd, caring for four-legged sheep, to being king over Israel, ruling over two-legged sheep. And uh, I want you to keep your place here in 2 Samuel 23. And go back, if you will, to 1 Samuel chapter 22. 1 Samuel and chapter 22. Let's read the first two verses there. David therefore departed thence and escaped to the cave Adullam. And when his brethren and all his father's house heard it, they went down thither to him. And everyone that was in distress and everyone that was in debt... And everyone that was discontented gathered themselves unto him, and he became a captain over them, and there were with him about 400 men. It says, all those in distress, verse 2, came to David. Those in debt came to him. Those who were discontented, uh, they had sorrows in their heart and souls, they came to him. And he became a captain over them. He led them all. He was the one they looked to for help and for comfort and for direction and for guidance. What a marvelous uh, foreshadow, a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ who would one day come. Christ told his disciples, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Matthew 11, verses 28 to 30. And Christ is said to be the captain of your salvation, Hebrews 2, verse 10. However, King David could not have become great. He could not have succeeded all by himself. Uh, go back, if you will, to 2 Samuel 23 again. And let's pick up there at verse 8. These be the names of the mighty men whom David had, the Tachmanite that sat in the seat chief among the captains, 
The same was Adino the Esnite. He lift up his spear against 800 whom he slew at one time. And after him was Eleazar the son of Dodo the Ahohite, one of the three mighty men with David. When they defied the Philistines that were there gathered together to battle, and the men of Israel were gone away, he rose and smote the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand clave to the sword. And the Lord wrought a great victory that day, and the people returned after him only to spoil. And after him was Shammah, the son of Agi, the Herorite. And the Philistines were gathered together into a troop, where was a piece of ground full of lentils, and the people fled from the Philistines. But he stood in the midst of the ground and defended it, and slew the Philistines, and the Lord wrought a great victory. The Word of God tells us about many of David's mighty men. These three distinguished themselves over all the rest, and they serve as examples to you and I today. These men were especially brave. They were loyal to their king. Uh, they could be trusted. They weren't afraid to fight for King David. They had the shepherd king himself as their captain, their commander, uh, as setting an example, the one who had killed the Philistine giant Goliath with a slingshot. You know, it would have been pretty uh, difficult to come up with an acceptable excuse for not fighting when King David was your captain. He slew a giant Goliath of Gath, uh, six cubits in a span. That means he was about nine and a half feet tall. You get on the internet sometime, go through, you know, I don't normally want to recommend the internet or YouTube, but there are some very informative videos there. One's got a, uh, some good production of the history of giants and giant skeletons found throughout the earth. And all over North America, all over this continent of the United States, were giant skeletons found seven, eight feet tall, some taller than that. And uh, most of the time, they had double rows of teeth in their mouth like a shark. And on a few occasions, six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot. But all of that is, and you know, in these, you have to go back to the 1800s and you read these burial mounds that they were excavating and they'd send the, the bones off to the Smithsonian and then the thing never got heard from again. But there were enough newspaper reports and news articles uh, a century ago. They, they're all over the place. Santa Rosa Island, which is off the coast of California, they found a bunch of giant skeletons there. Double rows of teeth in their mouth. And um, I found, found an interesting video that actually shows pictures of some of these skeletons, double rows of teeth uh, in their jaws and so forth. But uh, nine and a half feet tall, if we were to compare them to modern measurements, and David slew him with a slingshot. So if he was your example, you'd have to have a pretty good excuse for not fighting with armor. But uh, David had learned to be brave and to show courage as a young shepherd caring for his father's sheep, protecting the sheep. And he told King Saul that uh, when he had been tending the flocks, thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, First Samuel chapter 17. Am I how the church today uh, needs men of and women of courage like that more than ever before? And you read that account in First Samuel 17 of David and Goliath, and it says that David ran to meet the Philistine. He wasn't afraid of him. He said there was some Philistine can that was going to be kicked that day, and he was ready to do it. Sir Winston Churchill once said, courage is the first of needful human qualities, because it is the quality which guarantees all the others. Do you know the word pastor means shepherd? And a pastor is to care for the flock that God has given to him or entrusted to him. And uh, he's to protect the flock. He's to be an example if he can. And Paul preached in Acts 20, verse 28, to the elders in Ephesus, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, which to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. The blood of Jesus Christ was the blood of God. 
he was God manifest in the flesh. And a pastor is to feed his flock the word of God uh, in its purity and in its truth. Uh, Paul said, for I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Acts 20, verse 29. So a pastor, much like a shepherd, is to protect his flock and to warn them of dangers. You say, well, you sure run down other groups a lot, Pastor Shrive. That's I'm trying to warn you. I'm trying to, don't, don't, be, don't be sucked in by some of the nonsense that passes as modern Christianity. I, I, this has got to be the most biblically ignorant age that's ever existed in the history of the church. I mean, there are a multitude of new Bible translations about, since from 1900 to 2000, or let's 2018 now, from 1900 to 2018, there were published and put onto the market uh, well over 100 different translations of the Bible in English. Every one of them claiming to be updating the English. Now, finally, we've got it in our own language. Now, finally, the Word of God. And then two years later, now, finally, we've got the Word of God. It, was just, it goes on and on. And yet, everyone's got the whatever version they prefer, and nobody's reading any of them. The Bible says, Ecclesiastes 8, 4, where the word of a king is, there is power. And who may say unto him, what doest thou? They all want to stand in the shadow of the King James Bible. And hopefully it's a power and authority will fall upon their um, product. But it never does. When you've got the best, why bother with the rest, right? But um, today's church has too many conscientious objectors in the Lord's army. Too many people are spiritual pacifists. They don't want to do anything for the sake of Jesus Christ. Notice, and um, I, I call this, I'm, I'm going back to a sermon I preached about four years ago, and I call this the three amigos. The three amigos. All that was sort of introduction. There are a number of famous trios in the world. There are those Italian singers known as the three tenors, uh, there are the three musketeers in literature. I'm more of a three stooges kind of guy myself. How many of you know that the three stooges were all Jews also, were all Jewish? Curly Howard was named Jerome Horowitz, and uh, then Larry Fine. Mo Howard was Moses Horowitz. Shimp Howard was Samuel Horowitz. You don't get much more Jewish than those names. But... Um, Manny, Manny Moe and Jack, the Pep Boys, they're the three best friends your car ever had. And um, Clint Eastwood had a trio of people he addressed in one of his movies, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. <laughs> and, of course, a uh, number of other trios such as that, which we won't bother with. But uh, I call this the three amigos, based on those three soldiers of David. And the first one I want to call your attention to is in verse 8. It describes a man named uh, Adino or Adino. He slew 800 enemies of Israel single-handedly. And I would liken Adino to a Christian who is uh, busy leading others to the Lord Jesus Christ. He was a soul winner. Do you know when you uh, begin to witness to some unbelieving person, you begin to tell them about their need to be forgiven, about what Christ offers to them, and what the gospel of Christ means you are engaging in spiritual battle. There's spiritual warfare and combat taking place in the unseen world. Peter calls the devil your adversary who walketh about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. 1 Peter 5, 8. And if he's your adversary and your enemy, he's going to oppose everything you try to do for Jesus Christ, leading another soul to Christ, chief among them. But uh, there's spiritual warfare taking place when you tell some unbelieving man or woman about the Lord Jesus Christ and the simplicity of the gospel. Uh, a pastor isn't supposed to, he can't do all the soul winning or talking to people by himself. Uh, he can't pass out all the gospel tracts. I always get a blessing when I hear or learn of any of our church members who are passing out tracts during the week that their job or the business they uh, are engaged in. And we all need help from one another. 
it's a team effort anyway. 1 Corinthians 3, 6, the Apostle Paul wrote, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God uh, gave the increase. So many times your testimony, your life, the way you conduct yourself as a believer, and people know that you're, you profess to be a believer, you either are planting a seed in someone's heart or you are watering a seed that someone before you planted. And when the time is right, God causes it to come forth and that person is under conviction and they know that they need to receive Jesus Christ. But you don't, never think that you as a, someone witnessing for Christ did it all. You didn't do it all. Someone before you did something that had an imp, made an impression on that person's heart and their mind and their thoughts. And then you come along and you've watered that seed. Uh, or it may be that someone before you has planted, someone then watered. And you happen to be there when it's ready to spring forth. And that person says, yes, I want to receive Christ as my Savior. But in the end, it's God who causes the increase and causes it to come forth. Um, verses 9 and 10. We read about another mighty man named Eleazar. He fought so hard that his hand froze around the hilt of his sword so that uh, he couldn't put it down. He couldn't let go of it. For the believer, you're told to take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Ephesians 6, 17. Eleazar would be like uh, any Christian who knows his Bible well. And he's able to, do, to defend the Bible. And he uses it. You know, uh, a weapon or a sword in the hands of a very skilled soldier can be a very effective weapon. Some people's sword is no more than a butter knife. So don't expect much from that. And, um, but when you hold in your hands the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, it's funny how one book has caused such a stir in the world. The book we're reading from right now. It's the book all other Bibles want to be like. Uh, it's the book authorized by the king. You know, King James, the first of England, James means Jacob. The supreme empire of the world at the time was the empire of Great Britain. They used to say the sun never sets on the British Empire. That is, around the world, every time zone, there was some outpost, some British colony that they had established. And in the 1700s and the 1800s, uh, sailing ships and trade ships were going all around the world, expanding the British Empire, and they were taking this Bible with them. Atheism hadn't risen to prominence. Uh, skepticism hadn't made any headway yet. And uh, this book was dominating everywhere it went. It's funny how one book can change the vocabulary, can change the development of the English-speaking races of people uh, 400 years later, and it still represents the, the uh, apex of the English language. The highest development, uh, the acme of, of the English language represented in between the covers of one book is the King James Version of the Bible. But, uh, and... God needs people who, the church rather, needs people who are reading their Bibles on their own during the week. So that when we gather on Sunday or we gather at church time, the stories and the texts and the references we mention in the sermons aren't foreign to everybody. And you're not, and you don't fall prey to some of the, the silliness of, let's say, Roman Catholicism or New Age religions. Uh, some false ideas of cults. Hebrews 4 and verse 12 says, For the word of God is quick. That means it's alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Do you know who it is with whom we have to do? This book right here. The, 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 that scripture personalizes the written words of God as, a, as having personality and able to read your mind. You know, other religions have candles, they have incense, they have costumes, they have special effects, they have all kinds of things. And they have a written, written script that they're supposed to follow and not deviate from. 
uh, they have images, they have statues, they have beads around their neck, they have a whole host of things. God gave to the Christian only one physical, tangible object that we actually touch and hold and make part of our life and worship. It's a book. I don't need a medallion, I don't need a string of beads, I don't need a statue, an image, I don't need candles, I don't need incense. I don't need a priest. My priest already made the sacrifice sufficient for me. Now he sits at the right hand of God, interceding for me when I pray. And he sends the Holy Spirit into my body to be in constant fellowship with God, constant communion with him. So I can pray to God uh, anytime, day or night, 24 hours a day. But God gave us one physical object to actually put our hands on and touch and to interact, have interaction with, and it's that book. Let me move on here. You might be the only one around who uh, takes God's book seriously. Fewer and fewer Christians are taking their Bibles seriously, their Bible study, their Bible learning, their not Bible knowledge is uh, becoming less and less. And it's a sign of the time. Still, Jonathan told David in 1 Samuel 14, 6, there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. So even if you're the only one who takes the Bible seriously and believes that it's perfect from cover to cover, and your job isn't to change the Bible, the Bible's job is to change you. Even if you're the only one that sees it that way, God is still able to do something through you if you're yielded to him. But a real Christian soldier will stand by the words of God in God's book, come uh, hell or high water. Now, lastly, in verses 11 and 12, we read about another uh, one of David's brave men. His name is Shama. Shama. It says he stood his ground and defended a certain piece of land that belonged to Israel. Even though he had to do it by himself, everyone else had fled. It belonged to the people of God, and he wasn't going to relinquish it to an enemy. And I think Shama has something to teach us about a Christian with certain standards and convictions that should never be compromised. There's the standard of our gospel. It's Jesus Christ himself who said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, John 3.3. 3. Salvation is not in church membership. It's not in water baptism or good deeds and kindness. It's not in good intentions or kindness to others. It's not in the seven sacraments. It's not in the 32 degrees of a free and accepted Masonic Lodge. It's not in the eternal progression of the Mormon religion and so forth. By the way, Mormonism is simply the free and accepted Mason's Lodge. Joseph Smith, the founder of Mormonism, was a Mason. Brigham Young was a Mason. Some of their early collaborators were also Masons. Masons build temples, so the Mormons build temples. Masons wear aprons, so the Mormons wear aprons. Masons have secret grips to identify one another, so the Mormons have special handshakes. Masons have closed door ceremonies, so the Mormons have closed door ceremonies in their temples. Masons have that compass in the square interlocked with the, as their symbol, and uh, you can si find those two symbols stitched on the on the chest of Mormon underwear, special undergarments. It's, they, simply, they simply overemphasized God and family a little bit more and created this, this false book uh, called the Book of Mormon that they say is part of scripture. And um, it's simply large, largely plagiarism from the Bible and um, convinced the world that this is a new religion. This was the religion Christ taught when he first came here and it got corrupted many, many generations ago until Joseph Smith restored it once again. They call what they preach the restored gospel. But it's simply um, um, free and accepted Masonic rites and rituals. But there's no salvation in that. Jesus told Thomas, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me, John 14, 6. There's no salvation, there's none, zero, zip, uh, apart from faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did for the sake of the sinner. Years ago, right after the death of President Franklin Roosevelt, flags all over the country were at half 
uh, staff, half mast. And there was a Presbyterian preacher named Charles Woodbridge. And he was dealing with some sinner about his soul. And the sinner told him, Dr. Woodbridge, if you would lower your standards just a little bit, your church would be filled to overflowing. He preached righteousness. He preached holiness and virtue. Dr. Woodbridge looked out the window and saw a flag at half mast. And he replied, do you see that flag flying at half mast? When the standard is lowered, that's what they used to call a flag. It's known as a standard. When the standard is lowered, it means somebody has died. As long as I live, the standard of the gospel will never be lowered for any man. Shama stood uh, and defended the qualities, the virtues, the standards of what it means to be a true believer in Jesus Christ. There are many other standards, I suppose, and convictions that we should never let slip. I should give an inch in defending. There's the standard of your Christian reputation. Used to, that used to be years ago, if you'd say, you know, not only is he a good employee, but he's also a very fine Christian. That used to be a high compliment. It means very little these days. Thanks to the Calvary Chapel and the TBN, the TV ministry corrupting the, the standard of Jesus Christ and the name of Jesus Christ, the good name of Christians around the world. It means very little. I would challenge you to make it mean something once again. The word glorify gets mystified as if it was something of great spiritual intrigue. Um, but it simply means to honor Jesus Christ here and now. If there's some thing that doesn't honor him, don't engage in. If there's some place that doesn't honor him, don't go there. If there's certain people that don't, don't honor Jesus Christ, don't hang around with them. And you might, that's why I say you might be the only person with certain standards. You might be the only person who believes the book is the word of God. But God will honor it. God will, God sees it. God sees what's going on in your heart. He sees what's going on outwardly and inwardly, unlike man. I had a friend of mine I worked with. He went to one of these contemporary churches and he, he said, now, um, we don't care what you dress like uh, when you come to church because we look at your heart. And I thought, how do you do that? How are you able to do that? I mean, I know he was sincere and he, he meant we don't hold that against you if you're not dressed in nice clothes to come to church. But the way he said it, this made me laugh inside. <laughs> we look at your heart. I can't see your heart and I doubt if you can see my heart. But, um, but God can. But God can. And you may be the only person who wants to live a clean and a virtuous and a moral life for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. And nobody else around wants to. Live for him anyway. Live for him anyway. And in a hundred different ways, you either are standing uh, for ground that Jesus Christ has given you, or you're relinquishing it to the enemies of Christ by your faith in the truth of the Bible, by your confidence in the power of prayer, by the kind of music you listen to, the kind of clothes you wear, the kind of books you read, the kind of way you act around the opposite sex, by the way you smile at people, by your temperament, by your kind of humor, by your good judgment in making lifelong decisions. Uh, you know, only a fool or an immature person goes out and gets their body all tattooed up. And like I said not long ago, they need to have truth and advertising rules apply to tattoo artists where they can show you a computer mock-up of what that tattoo is liable to look like 30 years from now. See if you still want it. <laughs> they might, you might not want it. You say, well, I have a tattoo. I'm not talking about the tattoo you got in the past. Just don't get any more. But when you're, I saw some, some family, we were, we were camping with brother and sister Lee up in Kings Canyon. And there was a kid down by the water. He was about seven years old. And he already had a tattoo on his body. His parents undoubtedly had authorized it. I could tell that wasn't just a, a stick on one. That was a real thing. And I thought, what kind of foolish parents authorize that sort of thing? Let's go down and get tattoos together, everybody. Don't you know, uh, only body piercing is acceptable with God. <laughs> I'm not just kidding. <laughs> I'm just laughing. But um, 
I and, and Pastor Kim, and um, as pastors, we need men and women who will be brave to defend the ground God has given them. It's easy to criticize. It's easy to cause trouble. It's easy to find fault with other Christians. Um, but God wants Christian soldiers who are faithful where he puts them, will defend the honor of Jesus Christ, defend the honor of the church, defend the word of God. And um, I'm going to leave it right there and, and ask that you and I seek to make these things mean something once again, to win souls, to study that Bible and to know how to defend it and to stand by it. And thirdly, to stand by Christian virtue, Christian standards that by, by which you and I should be known.